I am Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Hey guys, it's uh, Joel Richardson, and I'm here with Dalton Thomas. So we're just uh, sitting out in the bazaar on the street. We're in Irbil, Iraqi Kurdistan, and we thought it would be a good time. There's going to be a lot of noise, so we're going to try to talk loud. Um, but we thought it would be a good time just to talk about some good stuff, some big stuff that's forthcoming, um, to make a few announcements. So the first thing... All right, so the first announcement uh, that we have is late summer, early fall, we're going to be releasing Sheep Among Wolves 2. So many of you have seen Sheep Among Wolves first one. Number two is going to be amazing. Yeah, this is for FAI Studios is producing it. This is our eighth feature film. Um, but this isn't about FAI. This is a film about the church in Iran. This is the story of the fastest growing church in the world today, which is behind this mysterious veil of confusion and controversy over the nation, the people of Iran. Who, what is Iran? Who are the people of Iran? In many ways, I think we could say this, there's there's two Iran. You have the regime, you have the government, then you have the Iranian people. And within the Iranian people, we have this phenomenon that is the fastest growing church in the world. Now, when we talk about the, the, the film hones in on their story, which really is, when we look at what are the key characteristics of the church in Iran, the fastest growing church in the world today, that's entirely Muslim background, aggressively pro-Israel, that's crazy, mostly led by women, completely decentralized, has no denominational leanings or affiliations, there, meaning there's no center, there's no, there's no head, there's no, uh, you know, there's not an established infrastructure like the churches that we have in the West. It's a disciple-making movement. The Iranian church has no bank accounts, no government legitimacy, no buildings, no 501c3 status, and yet it's the fastest growing church in the world today. And so the way where we've approached the story is, number one, to just tell the story, but to hear the background of the church on, to get to know the leaders in the church on, to get to know um, those who have been the instruments, the catalyst for this explosive disciple-making world. And the other side is to explore the implications for the church in our generation, because I believe that, you know, one of the key texts that the film is structured around is Revelation 12, 11 which is they, they overcame the evil one by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. In many ways, the church in Iran is operating in the power of the blood of the Lamb, the power of the word of their testimony, not loving their lives unto death, and they're really forerunning this in an authority that we in the West, we've got lots of, we have lots of good stuff in the West, but we lack a lot of the critical things that the church in Iran has. And so I think one of the major components of the film is exploring uh, the witness, the testimony of this church, which to me, I think, is the closest resemblance of the early church that I've ever come in contact with and, and, and ever heard about or been familiar with. So it's going to be a, a very, very powerful film. Hold on one sec. Distraction is for the weak. So, I mean, you and I have been blessed. We've been able to spend time with a lot of the leaders in the underground church in Iran really the past several years on a handful of occasions. Um, I know personally for me, every time I'm with them, I preach all this stuff. I talk all this stuff. But being with them as they live it, it changes me every time. So this is... This is our effort, as much as possible, to sort of pull the curtain back so the Western church can peer behind the curtain, get to know these incredible brothers and sisters that we've gotten to know. But there's a larger issue here, which is 
trying to connect the values, the convictions, the authority that they have so that we in the Western Church who we talk a lot, um, that we can actually connect with the substance of the things that we talk about. So there's a big issue right now that's happening globally, which is to say, I mean, this is really, we're well into this process, which is the shift from the church, we'll say in the north, to the global south. So oftentimes as Americans, as Europeans, as Westerners, we tend to think that we are the heart and the foundation of the global church. But the fact of the matter is that we're shrinking and they're exploding. So talk about the global self. What does that mean? And why are we trying to connect the, the, the Western church with the global south? Yeah. If, you, if we take the global body of Christ today and we break it down like by language, skin color, ethnicity, it's not predominantly white and English speaking. That's the minority. Meaning there's in many countries on, in the world today, there's actually, you know, more believers of certain denominations in single countries like China and Korea and Nigeria than there are in the entire UK or the US. We're, we're seeing, what we're seeing is this shift where, not, it's not just about numbers, because I think this is the important thing. When Jesus talked about the fullness of the Gentiles coming in, I think it's both quantitative, but qualitative as well. Meaning the church in Ephesians 4 before the end is going to grow up into the maturity of the full stature of Christ, but also the unity of the faith. And I think the, 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 the value of the witness of the global, the church in the global south right now, is that they're rising in areas of maturity to where I think in the West we're very, let's say, anemic. And I'll give you an example. And this is one of the most, I think, one of the most powerful dimensions of the film is exploring the lives of the female leaders of the church in Iran. Because when you hear their stories, for example, pretty much every woman in Iran has been sexually abused. Now, almost every single one. And it's a very normal thing culturally in Iran for all women. It's just kind of a thing that it's just very normal. It's horrific. And when these women come to faith, the, the way that the Lord brings them through the process of not only forgiveness and healing and transformation, but then being the catalytic agents and witnesses for their family. And this is how the gospel is spreading in Iran, is through trauma and injustice. Now, why is that such an important thing for us right now? Because we're living in a very altruistic generation in the Western world that's very justice-oriented. It, I think, has lost the, let's say, the, the, the foundational hope of the gospel. When Jesus came once for sin, he's coming again. And I think the church in Iran, the global south, has really laid hold of that because they don't have uh, a plan B. This is everything. It's it's not, and you know, in the West, the Lord, for us, is kind of like a, you know, an add-on. You know, you have your life and you have the add-on of, of Jesus. Whereas for the believers in Iran, this is everything. You choose to follow him, game over. You know, you, you may not lose your life physically, but they lose their lives. They give their lives away to follow him. And I think this is the, the enduring value of, of the church in the global south today. So one of the things uh, in the film that we hit on is this issue of Maranatha. Yeah. So first of all, we announced this in Israel, January 2018, the launch of a network, a guild, a delta, we're calling it by various names, different metaphors to communicate what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so jump in, talk about Maranatha. Yeah, the film's good to it, exploring what Maranatha is and what it looks like in real time. Um, it, a number of years ago, when, in fact, when you and I first started engaging with the church in Iran, it opened up all these interesting relationships globally, where we started asking a number of real fundamental questions. Fundamental question number one. What does a Muslim background believer from a place like Iran or Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, who do they relate to once they come to faith? You know, in the U.S., it's very, how, how do we hear the gospel in the West? You meet someone who may be open, and what do you say to them? You say, come to my church, right? You come to the church, and then you hear the gospel through uh, Calvary Chapel, or a, a Baptist church, or a Presbyterian yeah. church. And then you go, and you... Or, you know, maybe you stay with that denomination your whole life, 
maybe you shift over to another denomination later down the track because of doctrine or whatever. Well, the thing is, there's not a come... The, our culture in the U.S. has come to my church building and hear my pastor give the gospel to you. In Iran and Syria and Lebanon and Iraq, the gospel is, not, is, is, is come with me and let's discover Jesus together. And so it's a difference between a, a movement of converts and a movement of disciples. And so the question then becomes, if you have a disciple-making movement that's not tethered to a denomination, what's their identity? You know, in the U.S., we, oh, well, I'm charismatic, I'm Presbyterian, I'm Baptist, but what are you if you're a former Muslim who chose to follow Jesus? Yes, you're a Christian, but what's your family? And so one of the things working in the Middle East over the last decade that we've run into is this, this mounting problem, which is a great problem, is first-generation Muslim background believers saying, who's my family? They turn on, you know, they go on Facebook and they see something from a famous preacher, pastor, denomination, conference in the West, and they go, is this us? Is this who our family is? You know, and we, we've been like, well, kind of, but... <laughs> because... I'm hesitant about exporting anything from the West to the East. My conviction is we need to be exporting or importing things from the East to the West for the maturity of the church. And so Maranatha became, how do we tether together the power of the church in the East with the anemic state of the church in the West? How do we connect that in such a way with the church in the West? Because here's we, we have a, a Messianic complex. We believe that we exist to help the world. And I think what the Lord wants to do is to, is to, is to say to the church in the West, guys, you need the church in the East. We need help. We need help. So that's that's pro that's one problem. The other problem is this. The church globally right now is not prepared for the coming of the Lord. In the sense that our hope, both East and the West, is, is we're not fixated like the early church on the return of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And the word Maranatha, the whole movement was started out of this powerful word in 1 Corinthians 16, where the Apostle Paul is speaking to a church in division, in delusion, in selfishness, in brokenness, and he's calling them to come together, and he gathers them around Israel in 1 Corinthians 16. He unifies the early church, unreached people, which he unifies them around Israel, the redemptive covenant of story of Israel, and then he unites them around relationship with one another. You know, he's saying, Timothy's coming, Apollos, Priscilla and Apollo, Fortunatus and Stephanus. He's naming all these people and locations and connecting them. And then he ends the chapter and the whole book by saying this, if anyone does not love, love the Lord, let him be anathema, maranatha. And so it's a little play on words. And the meaning of the word maranatha is either the way you pronounce it in Aramaic, the Lord has come, or the Lord is coming, the Lord come. And so it's, I would say this, Maranatha is a global fellowship, a disciple making, a fellowship of disciple makers fixated on the return of Jesus, who are fixated upon the maturity of the church by the unification of the body in an Ephesians 4 way that's both unified and diversified, that's growing up into the stature of Christ. In a way, it's nothing new, it's a return to the first name. So, what, what is Maranatha? It's a global fellowship. It's a out of control movement that we don't even know how big it is because we don't have centralized control of it. Right. It's growing in places like Iran, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Israel, Lebanon, Mexico, South Pacific. It's exploding and we don't have control over it. And that's the most beautiful thing. We don't know who's in charge because he's in charge. Right. So one of the things, you know, you say Maranatha, he has come, he is coming again. It's both. He has come, he's coming again, but the, this is how I love it is as essentially a cry, a prayer. It's a cry, Lord, come, come, Lord Jesus. And, you know, I think there's, um, in terms of what we're articulating, which is sort of a, uh, a network of like-minded folks who really value discipleship making, who really value the completion of the Great Commission, who want to bring the global self together with the Western Church so we can all, you know, the global body of Christ, rather than saying the hand says to the eye, I don't need you, Instead, it goes, I really need you very much, you know, and understanding that basic principle. Um, but there are some other networks out there that kind of do some of that. But one of, or really a couple of the primary underlying distinctives that makes Maranatha very much very different is that, first of all, there's this very clear Israel-centric uh, emphasis. 
which is that we understand the gospel, you know. That's when, led by Muslims. Yeah, that, which is amazing. Yeah, the, the, and this, this emphasis is championed by former Muslims who have come into relationship with the Jewish king. And so there's an understanding of the Israel centricity of the story of redemption, the Israel centricity of the gospel. Okay, so this is a non-negotiable. This is one of the foundational tenets, uh, convictions of Maranatha. And second, it's a discipleship movement that's driven by a passion for the return of Jesus. This is not, you know, within the church, there's such a wide variety of eschatologies, you know, and we love and value folks that don't share our eschatology, but in terms of Maranatha, this is a network for those that are crying out, that have a passion, that have a vision for the return of Jesus, that have that Maranatha cry. We're saying this was clearly the cry of the early church, and let's recover the Maranatha cry, because again, in the Western church, yeah, you have little segments that talk about the return of Jesus. You have some that talk Bible prophecy, this, that, and the other thing, but you don't have that early church emphasis, the centrality on the blessed hope, the anchor of our hope. You know, this is the focal point of all biblical expectations, so we're trying to recover that. So that's kind of a message, messaging issue, but it's also central, uh, I mean, just central to this fellowship that we're bringing together. Believers from the underground church in Iran, believers from the West, believers from Nigeria, you name it, we're all coming together, and we have this core conviction, come Lord Jesus. And so that's definitely something that it's essential to be emphasized, and again, the Israel centricity of it. You have a brilliant line in the film. It's one of my favorite lines. It, it, it closes out a segment about telling the Maranatha story. And you say, uh, the church in the West, we have the hallelujah down, but we've lost the Maranatha. Right. Meaning we need to take, in the same way that you can go to a church in the Amazon and you're going to hear someone say, you know, uh, hallelujah. We need to see Praise that God. pumped globally into the blood scene. So we're all saying with one accord, Maranatha, until he actually comes. Yeah. And it's neat, the greeting. You see it, you see it, brother, you see it. Maranatha, and they repeat back, Maranatha. It's just, we're recovering something awesome. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about, we've talked about Sheep Among Wolves too. We've talked about Maranatha. Is there anything else you want to hit on Maranatha? Yeah, one thing I think is incredibly important, I think that's different, it's a new perspective I think is very important. When we talk about issues like Israel and eschatology in the West, we talk about them, um, in a way, this is kind of crass, but we talk about them in kind of, it's kind of entertainment. It's kind of hobby, you know? It's not our, like, lifeblood. It's not the foundation of who we are. It's, it's, like, it's like a sports team that we root for. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like, well, hey, are you pre mill or post mill? Or kind of like, you like the, are you, you, know, are you old miss or, you know, I don't know, football, football or whatever. Yeah. Roll Tide. It, it, it's like teams, you know? Yeah. There's, you don't find teams in the first two church. It's in their blood. And the thing that I that I love about the most, this is the thing. We're not hammering the issue of Israel because we're a couple of white guys from the U.S. who learned a particular eschatology at a Bible school that we really love. We're pushing this issue because in the Muslim world, in the Middle East, you can't escape the issue of Israel. It's on everyone's mind. It's it's on it's on all the TVs. Everyone's talking about it everywhere. So you can't have a gospel that's about Jewish blood from a Jewish Messiah who was prophesied by Jewish prophets according to Jewish scriptures to the Jewish nation. And you can't say, oh yeah, he provides salvation. We don't, we're not going to talk about anything Jewish. He's coming back as a Jewish king to rule the world. From Jerusalem. Right. Now, the, this is a big problem for the Muslim world because this... What? It's the exact antithesis of everything that we've believed. And now, all of a sudden, here we are worshiping a Jewish king. And this is why it's so powerful. This is not a garden variety church network. This is something I think... That, and, and because it's led... Maranatha is predominantly led by Muslim background believers in the Middle East or first generation, which is powerful. It's very much a, I, I, I do believe it's more of a return, a rediscovery of the foundations of the early church than it is like a new strategy or some the next cool hip church planting thing. I think it is getting back to the core of what the church is intended to be in its configuration as an apocalyptic people awaiting the return of the Son of David. Right, yeah. No, I mean, it's important. I, I, I found this with missionaries, and it's a very natural thing. But you move to another country, you move to another culture, and the first thing as a Christian worker, 
in the Muslim world, you want to do is you want to build relationships with people, right? And that's natural. You want to build a connection. Well, the easiest and thus the laziest way to do that is to identify with prejudices, identify with hatreds. You know, you bump into someone and you're like, hey, how do you feel politically about Trump? How do you feel politically about Obama? And they go, I hate Trump, I hate Obama. And you go, yeah, I'm going to blank Obama. Well, you just formed a bond. Well, in too many parts of the, of the Muslim world, if, with regard to Israel, all you have to do is sort of be anti-Israel. Well, so unfortunately, and this is what's amazing, is a lot of the missionaries that are trying to love on and reach the Arab world, they, without always realizing it, because they're trying to build a bond, they compromise and they throw Israel under the bus. Oh, it's the norm. This is the norm in the missions world today. And we're saying that's not okay, that's not it's not calling in. We're not saying it. The Muslim background church in the Middle East is saying it. Right, exactly. So, okay, so it's covered sheep among wolves too. Talked about the concept this, 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 and, and this, this, uh, this network this delta, this, this, this um, what do you call it, guild. So we've talked about those things, and then we've got a conference, a gathering that revolves around the theme of Maranatha, January 2019 in Israel. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah, so we, we did what we defined the soft launch of Maranatha at the beginning of this year. And throughout this year, we've been meeting in different locations around the world to cast the vision for telling the story there's different i would say i don't know how many ministries were kind of a, a part of the core discussion to launch this thing no one single ministry launched it it's not like maranatha is the ministry of you know the, the cool thing about maranatha is mega churches whole denominations house churches single ministries uh, are, are connected into this level because it's not in some way, we're, it, the message is like, hey, you don't have to change anything you're doing to be a part of this global fellowship, except want to go deeper, further, faster. That's If you care about the acceleration of the gospel, that's what needs to change. Let's go faster, further, deeper, and let's do it with a bond of affection for one another. So we've been kind of taking, we've been calling it a road show, going around the world and telling the story. Um, you know, in a couple of weeks, we're going to, to hold the European, the European conference. And then uh, January, we're going to be meeting right up on the Israel-Lebanon-Syria border at the Galileon Convention Center. It's an amazing location right up on the tri-state area up there, right under, where the Golan meets Lebanon, where the, the mountains wrap around. It's an amazing place. We're going to be meeting there, and we're going to have uh, about two and a half days, three days of the hard launch of this global movement. There'll be leaders from all over the world. Uh, and the thing that I love about it, I think, to, if, if I'm honest, the thing I love about it the most is it's the people that you'll never hear about who are like the most influential leaders. You know, they're not going to make, uh, you know, those lists of like the 25 top most influential Christian leaders in the U.S. They'll never make those lists, but they're leading the largest, most mature, fastest growing, reproducing discipleship movements in the world today. People you've never heard their name and you'll never hear their name. So I, I think another core distinctive, and this is where the conference is really important, to, to where the intersection is, this is not theorists. It's practitioners. It's people who are engaged in the knit and grit and the fire and the fury of this thing who are flipping the world. People are literally flipping the world upside down for the gospel. And so we wanted to extend an invitation for the church in the, in the West and the global South as well to come and to participate together at this peer level. So there's no like famous speakers and famous worship leaders. There's going to be amazing speaking and amazing worship leaders. We're not, this is, we're coming all. I, like everyone who's coming to speak or to lead is coming on their own investment. Like no one's profiting off of this. We said, let's come at a peer level, which is very unique in the Christian conference world because typically conferences are very like, come listen to the man, you know? And I think what the Lord is doing is flattening the hierarchy, destroying the pyramid structure, encouraging us to release the edges and to go global, go movemental. Because the gospel is so powerful, it can it can overpower any demonic influence in any culture. And that's what Maranatha is all about. Seeing all the nations brought into this story of the one who came to me again. Amen. It's going to be January 19th, 20th, 21 in Israel. Um, 
If you're interested, you can go online and sign up. We'll put up the link for folks that are interested. You can click through. Um, and then we're actually going to have a small little add-on sort of mini tour for folks that are interested just before the conference. Talk yeah. about that. Yeah, it's going to be cool. Uh, I live in Israel. I live in the Golan Heights. Um, we've been working with the Israeli Defense Force for the last number of years. And what we want to do is bring the global Christian community to Israel to connect with the legacy of Israel's military history. Seeing Israel through the lens of the past, present, future battles is a good way to say it. So before the gathering, if you're interested and you want to see it, maybe you've been to Israel a hundred times you've never been before, uh, come and join us for this Maranatha Legacy Tour where we're going to be... We're going to be hitting the borders of Israel. So we'll be, we'll be in Jerusalem, of course. We're going to go down to Gaza. We're going to go to the Golan, go to the Syrian border, go to the Lebanese border, hit the West Bank, hit the Palestinian issue. You're going to see the borders of Israel and connect with the tumultuous season of history of the Middle East through the lens of uh, current geopolitical things that are happening right now because we're in a very interesting time right now in the Middle East. And uh, this is going to be a very important time. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to be there at the, the tail end, probably the last couple of days of the tour. And then part of that tour will be there'll be a graduation ceremony for some of the folks that did Emmaus online. So I'm going to be there for that. And then I'll be there for the conference up in uh, the Golan. So looking forward to that. Anything else you want to throw in? Oh, uh, the, well, yeah. The film, we're going to release the film, Chief Mongols, for free. So once yeah. it drops, we want to encourage you guys to share it far and wide. We really believe that the Lord wants to encourage the global body with this. And it is, you know, we've, we've produced quite a few films. There's there's not a film like this film that we've... It, this is something else. It's something else entirely. Everyone who walks into the editing room walks out in tears. It's, it's a beautifully decimating film, and I don't think... I've never seen it in the movie. So share it far and wide. Yeah, share far and wide. And, and really, as we always do, I mean, it's very grassroots in terms of uh, distribution and so forth. So here's what, here's how you can bless us and bless the underground church is gather together in groups. Ask your pastor if he'd be interested in having a showing at the church. Call people together for an evening uh, in homes, uh, dorms, universities, wherever. Um, gather together in groups and if you would like to be someone to sponsor a group then try to get it together and then again releasing it for free and uh, we just we want this thing to spread far and wide um, like the fire that it is that it deserves just to, to spread all over the place so amen all good all right guys I hope that uh, this wasn't as distracting for you as it was for us um, but we're here in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan and we look forward to seeing you next time I'm Joel Richardson all, <laughs> All right, blessings. Okay, okay. Yalla, 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 yalla. That's too much. All right, yalla, 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 yalla. I'm affectionate, but not that affectionate.